I do have to say it's been probably two months since we had a decent article to review, but we finally found a good one for you. There really just hasn't been that many that have been good, um, but this one's good. So this is from Reproductive Biomedicine Online, RBMO for short, and it's called The Impact of Transferring a Poor Quality Embryo Along with a Good Quality Embryo on Pregnancy Outcomes in IVF ICSI Cycles. Why is this important? Well, I get asked all the time, what do we do if we want to do two embryos? And what if we only have two and one's good and one's not so good? Can we transfer both at the same time? What's going to happen? Am I going to get a better outcome? Am I going to get a worse outcome? What's going to happen overall? And so the question is, you know, what should you do under those circumstances? You got your four AA and then you've got your like three BC or CB. Is the three BC going to negatively impact your four AA? Great question. Right. So there have been previous articles on this. They said it does not impact things. But this is a Chinese study. And the one huge advantage of every single Chinese study out there, massive numbers, huge numbers. We can't even come close to those numbers in North America because they are doing umpteen million IVF cycles per year. I knew one fertility specialist that opened up a clinic in China. They had to pay forty five million dollars for the license, wow. just the license, okay? But they had to build a 500 bed facility because the province that they were building it in had 30 million people in it and they were gonna be the IVF center for oh, 30 wow. million people, Wow! right? Thank so you. yeah, crazy, mm -hmm. like wow. So anyways, um, we can screen share. Am I already sharing? Yeah, you're good. Okay. So here's the article, Impact of Transferring of a Poor Quality Embryo Along with a Good Quality Embryo. So um, let's flip over and I'll show you what they did. Here's the abstract. Um, so this is a retrospective cohort. So that's important. They went backwards and looked at their data. But they included 11,738 women. Big, big numbers of people. All of these women underwent IVF and ICSI, and they received um, frozen embryo transfers at a tertiary care academic medical clinic, and it went from 2015 to 2022. Study population was split into two groups, those that got single embryo transfers, what they called SBT, single blastocyst transfer, and those that got double blastocyst transfers, or DBT, okay? So the single was 9,338, and the double was 2,400. And when they did the double, they selected the group that had one good and one bad, okay? So uh, let's take a look at what they classified as good and bad and so on. So um, I'll just blow this up a little bit for you. So these were women who got single blastocysts. They were in their first IVF cycle with no other factors affecting pregnancy. Um, there were patients with uterine factors that made them unsuitable for twin pregnancies, like a scarred uterus, cervical weakness, or a history of twin, pre twin pregnancy with miscarriage or preterm birth. Patients whose overall condition was not suitable for twin pregnancies, like those that had um, problems with systemic diseases, or those with a really short height or a very, very low weight, less than 40 kilograms. What adult do you know of that's less than 40 kilograms? 40 kilograms. Yeah. <laughs> I need to lose 40 kilograms at this stage. Okay. So that was it. So there were, the next group was the double blastocyst transfers. So these were the patients that didn't meet the criteria, obviously, for single. They had had miscarriages or repeated implantation failures in advanced age. There are patients who insisted on the transfer of two embryos. Who did they exclude? And this is critical. No one that got an egg donor cycle. And interestingly, no one that got PGT. I don't know why they did that, because it would have been way better if they had done it with PGT, but they didn't. No one with an abnormal uterus or untreated endometrial polyps. And no one that used frozen eggs um, or embryos that were frozen very early on. Um, and so they did get some cycles that were lost to follow up, but overall they ended up with 11,738 women in the study. So uh, what did they find? I'm going to skip ahead to the graphs and review that with you. Oop, there we go. Okay, so 
Um, what can you see here? Maternal age, not statistically significantly different. Infertility duration, it was statistically significantly different, but it's actually not numerically different. This is important to understand when you have 11,000 patients in the study population, a three-day difference could be statistically significant. So it's not clinically relevant, but they did find a difference there. Infertility type was not significant. Fertility cause was not significant. Endometrial thickness was, but it's 10.4 in the single group versus 10.16 in the double group. I mean, that's not clinically meaningful, so I'm not worried about that at all. Fertilization type, whether it was IVF or IVF with ICSI, um, that was statistically significant. But again, you're talking about a 3% difference. So I don't know that that's clinically meaningful, but it was statistically significant. Um, very slight borderline change in the number of patients that had previously been pregnant, and then a big difference in the endometrial um, preparation protocol. So 6% um, more, 6.5% more had natural cycle transfers in the single blastocyst transfer group than they did in the double. Um, most of them, about half-half, had HRT protocols, and then 20% got a Lupron shot with a HRT protocol, a hormone replacement protocol in the SBT group versus 30% in the DBT group. So there were some differences in the endometrial preparation. They let the doctors basically treat people the way they wanted to. And because this is retrospective, you can't standardize. So take the results with the grain of salt that it deserves. Okay, so what about this graph? Um, this is important. So implantation rate, 70% in the single blastocyst transfer group versus 59% in the double. Now keep in mind, the implantation is the number of embryos implanted based on how many you put in there. So 70% of the singles did, but when you put in two, there is a statistically significantly lower implantation rate. And that's obvious because some of those bad embryos won't work, right? So you kind of expect that, but at the same time, it's worrisome. You couldn't figure this out unless you did a true randomized controlled trial, but the reality is that it does appear that you're gonna get lower implantation rates. However, the clinical pregnancy rate, meaning they could see a heartbeat, was a little bit higher, almost 9% um, higher in the group with the double blastocyst transfer rate. So they got a very high rate of clinical pregnancy, 76.7% versus 67.3. Miscarriage rate actually lower in the double blastocyst transfer rate. Our group, very surprising. You would expect that the ones that are getting the abnormal, not abnormal, but the weaker quality or poor quality embryo would have a higher miscarriage rate. They did not. It was actually the other group that did. Um, live birth rate, definitely higher. Again, almost 9.5% higher in the double blastocyst transfer group. Um, the multiple rate, though, look at the difference. Okay, so in the group that caught one embryo, 1.8% of them had a multiple pregnancy. Now, that by itself is a huge number because typically it's one in 300 that split. So your rate should be 0.3%. So this is much, much higher than that. It's six times higher than their the normal background rate, which is a lot. But then look at their rate in the group that had, um, you know, the, the actual double embryo transfer rate, 41.4%. So you have this huge number even with untested embryos that ended up with a, uh, you know, genetically, um, uh, a genetically, or, or not genetically, sorry, with a twin pregnancy or multiple pregnancies. So huge number, very, very concerning. So the other thing, um, gestational age at birth, very slightly earlier in the multiples, obvious, I don't think that's a big deal. Birth weight, a little bit lower in the multiples, Again, not a huge issue. Um, cesarean delivery rate, a little bit higher in the multiples. Again, that makes sense. Preterm birth rate, huge factor, way higher, three times higher in the group that had multiples compared to the group that did not have multiples. So all of these things need to be considered. Yes, you're getting a higher live birth rate, but you're taking on a higher preterm birth rate, you're taking on a higher cesarean section rate, lower birth weight, and 
you're looking very much at the potential that the implantation rate is actually lower. Uh, I need to get out of the pencil marking part of it. Okay, so then they did it by univariate analysis. So they took each individual little factor. And the things that they found that were significant for success were double blastocyst transfer, maternal age had a very big impact. Um, the body mass index had an impact. The endometrial thickness had an impact with an 11% difference between the groups. Um, the infertility type, secondary versus primary, secondary reduced your chances, which I found kind of interesting. You'd actually think those people would do better. They did worse. Um, infertility cause, if it was female factor, it was significant. If it was unexplained, it was also very significant. Hormone replacement therapy protocols did have the lowest success compared to natural cycles. So I harp on this all the time. Everybody out there is still using your hormone replacement therapy protocols. They're garbage protocols. Stop using them. Go back to doing natural cycles. It's much better. Or letrozole, which is even better than natural. And then the number of cycles you had done, the number of times you had been pregnant, and the number of times you had delivered, all had a very significant positive effect on um, the success rates. The last, uh, there should be another one. Yep, there we go. The last thing is that they did this overall analysis, controlling for all the different factors. So when they did that, what they showed was in the first adjusted model, which was adjusted for maternal age and BMI, you had almost a 50% increase in live birth if you use the double embryo transfer. So that is a big number, a very, very big number. And then at the same time, if you controlled for every other thing, like basically the endometrial preparation, the fertilization type, cycle number, all those things they found significant in the former table that I showed you, they actually found a 55% increase in live birth rate. So should everybody be asking for a double embryo transfer? Well, the answer is no, you should not all be answering, asking for a double embryo transfer because there are risks that come along with having twins. Maternal risks, hospitalization, stillbirth, miscarriage, bleeding, hypertension, preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, need for operative delivery. Fetal risks, if they come early and they come very early, you have all sorts of complications with the pregnancy. I won't list them all off. They're terrifying. And then social risk, because it's an 80% divorce rate when you have twins. So it's not all fun and games. There are side effects and impacts from this stuff. But if it's imperative for you to get a higher success rate, you will actually get a higher success rate, even if you're transferring a bad embryo with a good one. So for those of you that are kind of in desperation mode or maybe you haven't done PGT on your embryos and you're older, it may actually be beneficial to transfer two rather than one.